Welcome to today's global hour-long automotive broadcast. Today's webinar is a joint one between two TechWorks communities, ASIN and the IoT Security Foundation. Now, please bear with me today if I don't sound quite myself. I'm a bit under the weather with a heavy cold, so <laughs> I'm going to try and get through this as best I can today. Uh, whilst we're waiting for everyone to arrive, I'd like to let you know about the TechWorks Engineering Trustworthy AI initiative. We did an AI webinar this past summer and followed it up with a London workshop. Now, earlier this month, a new paper was published summarizing key findings on 18 perspectives for wider consideration for members of the TechWorks communities, including ASIN and the IoT Security Foundation. If you're watching this broadcast live, you can click on the link, which I'll put in the Zoom chat facility in a few moments. And if you're watching the recording of this webinar, please go to techworks.org.uk forward slash AI, where you can download the new paper and look out for details of the next AI event being announced this next week. Our first guest today joins us from California. He is speaking to us from his plush hotel room, which overlooks a Tesla factory. He is Lee Harrison of, he is Lee Harrison of Siemens, excuse me. And he is going to be presenting to us today on software defined vehicles. After Lee, we'll also hear from Paul Wooderson of Hariva Myra, who will present on hardware security. But now we cross over to Fremont in San Francisco Bay. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Um, right, so welcome everybody. Um, let me just get my presentation up. Okay, so um, the session today, um, as, as you know, is is talking about um, the emergence of, of software-defined vehicles. Um, so what I'm going to talk about in the, the next 20 minutes is, is really uh, what is a software defined vehicle? Um, what does that mean for um, automotive uh, designers, manufacturers? Uh, what are the implications on the uh, electronic hardware that goes into, into those vehicles? And what do we have to do to make sure that when we're developing these these new software defined vehicles, how do we make them safe, secure, um, and, and make sure that they're uh, as reliable as, as possible? So let me start off by um, just kind of doing a bit of a, a trek through history so we can understand exactly what a, a software defined vehicle is and how that differs from um, the, the the vehicles that we're used to today and the overall evolution of 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 cars and and how we how we got there. So, if we start off with what we would call um, vehicle one point zero, um, so this is everybody's kind of very familiar with uh, the basic car as we know it um, that would typically have very simplistic electronics in. Um, it certainly wouldn't be connected. And the electronics in the vehicle was was really built on a budget. It wasn't the key um, kind of value add in, in the vehicle at all. Um, then we saw the emergence of uh, more and more electronic content within the design, uh, within the vehicle. Um, and a lot of these features were, were based around adding convenience to the user and the driver. So you started to see technologies such as uh, sat-nav guidance systems, um, infotainment systems, and we started to see vehicles getting connected. Um, but primarily this connectivity was aimed at um, effectively adding a safety net to the vehicle. So if the vehicle was to break down or you were to have an accident, you would have a means to call for help. And that was about the level of the connectivity within the vehicle. If we move to where we are roughly today, um, so vehicle 3.0, um, today we see cars where there is uh, an increasing number of features and applications uh, within the electronics content within the vehicle. Um, and uh, 
there's a willingness to pay for all of this premium technology. So we're now seeing vehicles that are, are, are more and more connected, not just from a safety perspective, uh, but from an entertainment perspective um, and the ability to leverage a lot of these um, kind of new features. And then we come on to uh, what's being called the software defined vehicle. Um, and here we end up with a, a vehicle that is, um, it, it's not just a, a fixed set of features and capabilities, um, it's a very dynamic platform. So you can really mold and fit the, the vehicle to your own personal preferences um, and lifestyle. And a lot of the features that can be added to this, this software-based platform um, can even be um, delivered in a subscription-based model. So um, a lot of the features can be uh, paid for on a, on a monthly basis. So, for example, you could do things like um, pay a monthly subscription to get heated seats during the winter, but then you don't need to pay for those during the summer. So it's a very, very flexible platform um, and connectivity is an extremely important part of that overall um, new platform um, and development. So that's kind of, kind of where we've come from uh, and where we're heading. And if we look at how that really impacts the architecture of, of the vehicle, um, we talk about, let's say, the design cycle of, of vehicles in kind of yesterday. Um, the, the hardware and the software would be, be developed um, together and then you'd reach a point where the production of the vehicle would start uh, and the development of those elements would, would stop and then it would be kind of fixed in time. Um, but with the software defined vehicle what we find is the hardware gets complete but the software can be continuously developed throughout the whole life cycle of the vehicle. So essentially you can have a vehicle where um, uh, as you own it there's more and more features and capabilities being added to that vehicle um, throughout its life. And, and that's achieved essentially by, um, instead of having an, uh, an architecture within the vehicle that is made up of, of many, many different ECUs with their own individual functionality, um, we bring all of the, um, the compute power and, and the delivery of those features into a central compute engine. Um, and, and this kind of varies a little bit between vehicle architectures. It could be completely central, or we could have a I think terminology is a zonal implementation where there's um, maybe two or three different um, compute engines within the design. But what we're essentially doing is centralizing um, the hardware, uh, and then that hardware can support uh, a lot more flexibility in terms of the, the software content. Um, and what we see in terms of um, the, the hardware is that obviously, that just by definition of the name, it's a software defined vehicle. Um, so uh, unfortunately, there seems to be less attention paid to the hardware, but um, for a vehicle to be software defined, it has to be silicon enabled. So, um, and if we look at how the uh, the silicon and the uh, the compute elements of these vehicles um, is is growing over over time, um, you can see here in this graph as you add all of these additional features and capabilities, the compute power required for that centralized hardware um, is still today growing exponentially. So. Uh, and we expect this to continue for, for quite some time. So in terms of the hardware, what we're seeing is the requirements um, are just kind of exploding in terms of um, the amount of compute power that's, that's needed to drive these, these software-defined vehicles. Um, what does this mean to the semiconductor industry? Well, here you see a couple of trend lines. Um, the blue trend line is... Uh, essentially the uh, the overall trend in terms of um, technology node for the, the leading edge technology in the semiconductor industry. The red line is 
um, historically where the automotive industry has sat. And as you can see, back in the kind of early 2000s, the trend for the automotive industry was really to focus on the more mature technologies um, that brought with them kind of less risk, less cost, um, and and were, were more than capable of supporting the uh, the, the requirements of, of the electronics that were going into the, the vehicles. However, if you look at where we are today, and, and this graph is a couple of years out of date, we actually have now reached that crossover point where the automotive industry is now driving the leading edge semiconductor technology requirements. Um, so the, the automotive industry is really um, driving that leading edge uh, development from a, from a semiconductor perspective, which just in its nature brings a whole bunch of challenges in terms of, um, like I say, in the past, there was a reliance on uh, maturity. Now the silicon that's going into vehicles is, is very leading edge. So with that comes a certain amount of risk uh, that we have to try and mitigate um, because obviously we still want our, our vehicles to be 100% um, safe. So when we're designing um, ICs, semiconductors for uh, automotive applications, what do we have to think about? So first of all, testability. We want to make sure that the, the ICs that go into the vehicles uh, are 100% defect free. And the terminology used in the industry is essentially zero defect. So um, if you're to deliver uh, electronic components into the automotive industry um, and there are defects and there's a recall that's needed, we all know that, that a recall um, for an automotive OEM is a, is a huge cost. So there's a real effort to make sure that silicon that goes into vehicles is uh, essentially defect free. And the terminology we use here is zero defect. And what that means in essence is um, you'll never achieve zero defects, but we're, we're looking at achieving a target of less than one defect per, per million devices. Um, and even now that's changed and it's now uh, a, a billion devices. So, so really in, in a, in a, a delivery of a, a billion chips, we want less than one of them to be um, have have defects in. So it's a pretty pretty tall ask in terms of of quality. Then we have the safety. Um, so in all parts of the the vehicle development and automotive, we're all familiar with the various standards to make sure that um, the we're able to detect when faults and defects occur within the vehicle. And if something's going to fail, we need to make sure it fails in a, in a safe state. Um, and then security. Um, security is becoming more and more important. And, and as you can imagine, um, with the amount of software content and features and capabilities being added, um, the, the attack space for security um, is, is just exploding. So security is, is a huge topic. Um, in the automotive space, um, and it's uh, um, it's a real challenge to to get to a point where um, we we cover that um, attack landscape. And then SLM lifecycle management. Um, so this is really um, being able to monitor the various aspects of the silicon throughout the vehicle's life cycle. So making sure that it continues to work as expected. Um, and as with everything else, silicon ages. Um, you're, you're probably used to your, your mobile phones, your PCs. Um, they all start to get a bit cranky once they get a few years in. And the silicon will, will age, and it does have a, uh, an end life. Um, so really, really making sure that we, we monitor that and we know when um, things are going to fail to make sure that we we do preventative maintenance and to make sure that everything's done in a, in a safe and secure way. So by no means developing um, that hardware that, that supports the software-defined vehicle, it, it's not a trivial task. 
And if we look into some of those elements, so we talked about um, advanced test techniques. Um, and here's just an example of um, some of the, the type of defects that we try and target um, within the silicon. So here we're talking about um, really detailed, um, right down in the depths of the, the, the transistors within the silicon itself, looking for kind of uh, opens and short circuits and bridges within um, the, the actual silicon itself. Um, and, and not just um, uh, not just faults that are, are, are obvious and prevalent um, when you initially test the device, um, but defects that could emerge um, in the early use. So what we try and do is we try and stress the devices during our testing to make sure if there's a defect that's kind of, it's there, but it's not affecting the overall functionality of the device. Um, initially, um, we stress the device to make sure that those, those defects manifest themselves so we don't, um, we don't see those in the early life of, of the vehicle. Um, and then we have safety. So I say everybody's probably familiar with the, the ISO 26262. Um, it really looks out for two parts uh, of the IC development. Um, so you've got the systematic faults. So these are faults that could potentially be introduced during the, the design manufacture phase. Um, and then most importantly, you've got the detection of random faults. So these are the faults that occur throughout the life cycle of the vehicle, and they could be caused by any number of things, but it's really important to have the mechanisms within the silicon and the semiconductor uh, to be able to detect those faults when they occur, um, and not just to be able to detect them, but also make sure that once we have detected them, um, we, can, uh, we can take the appropriate action um, and if the device is going to fail, we make sure it fails in a in a safe safe way. Um, we also have um, the um, uh, safety of the intended function. Um, so this is a little bit different in terms of this is really checking to make sure that um, the uh, the device is being used for what it was actually intended for. Um, so, um, so it's quite easy to 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 leverage technology um, that's de designed for one thing and use it in a scenario that it maybe was never intended to be used for. So, um, so here we've, we we look at that aspect of it and make sure that the, the vehicle is being used within the bounds of of what the technology was initially specified for, and then. Like I said, the real challenge in today's development is the, the ISO 21434, which really looks out for these, um, these malicious faults that are coming through uh, cybersecurity attacks um, and, and, and all of those, those aspects of um, the, the attack service within the, the overall system. Um, so what do we do in, in the world of security to be able to make sure we can detect um, these type of attacks on the electronic systems, the electronic hardware within the vehicle. So, so here is a kind of a simplified um, illustration of the sort of technology that can be used. So the, the green boxes there, um, kind of in the middle, are the, um, the, the, the various functions in um, say a compute subsystem, so you've got CPUs, you've got memories, you've got bus controllers. Um, and then around that, we insert a whole bunch of different monitoring technology. So at the top, you've got things like bus monitors, instruction tracing, uh, status monitors. Um, and these passively monitor the operation of the, the device. And what we're, what we're really looking for here is is when the 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 device starts to operate operate outside of its regular profile. So um, 
as you can imagine, with a compute subsystem running a uh, predefined set of software, we know exactly what the profile of that software looks like. So we, we've got a very good understanding of the sort of transactions we should be seeing, the amount of transactions we should be seeing. Um, so one of the big things in terms of cyber attacks is um, when there's an attack on the vehicle, um, especially from the software perspective, we see uh, a lot of anomalies appear in terms of how the compute engine within the vehicle um, is is operating. So these can be detected by these, these monitors. Um, and then we've got another set of monitors that, that are down the bottom, which are referred to as, as sentries. Um, and these, whereas the other monitors are kind of passive monitoring, collecting data, the sentry monitors uh, are really there and they can they can be proactive. Um, so for example, if we see um, kind of illegal accesses to buses or, or memory, the, the sentry devices can actually block that activity there and then. So they can be very proactive and, and mitigate uh, very quickly. Um, I say very low latency here because these monitors are built into the hardware uh, and they sit right next to the subsystems that they're, they're monitoring. So in terms of the ability to detect and mitigate, uh, the, the practically zero latency. So, um, so there's a whole range of things we can do within the, the hardware to, um, to detect and mitigate against um, these type of cyber, cyber attacks. And then obviously with everything, we're all connected now. So um, one thing we can do with the monitors, um, the data that we collect, we can extract from the silicon um, and we can put up into the cloud. And once we've got data from a fleet of vehicles, uh, we can do a whole lot of smart analysis on that um, and start to use AI to, to really look at the overall trends of, of what's happening out there in, in, in the world. So, with that, let me let me kind of let, let's let's take a bit of a journey, um, and and kind of try and show how this technology um, kind of works in a, in a in a real life example. So we would take our, our friend here. He's he's happy. He's going to work. Um, he's got his software defined vehicle. Um, so at the start of the journey, he'll start up his vehicle. We do key on. Um, as part of the key on, we do a an initial system test. Um, so this is using the inbuilt system test technology and it will structurally test the, the silicon to make sure it's, it's defect free. We do that in a very, very quick manner to make sure that you're not sat there waiting for 15 minutes for the vehicle to test itself before you can, you can drive, but be rest assured that we do enough testing on the silicon um, to make sure it's, it's safe to, start your journey. So off we go. Um, and our friend here today, um, he likes the fact he's got a software defined vehicle. He's got all these personal settings and preferences uh, linked to application on his on his phone. His phone's connected to the infotainment system of the car. Um, but the night before he's been playing around, he's installed some, um, some new apps on his phone. Um, and what he doesn't realize is one of those applications has a bit of a Trojan horse in it. Um, so once the phone is connected to the infotainment system on the car, um, the Trojan horse that's now been installed on his mobile phone um, through the infotainment system, which sits on the, um, the, the vehicle bus, um, now has access to the whole, um, the whole periphery of the vehicle, all of the different elements within the car. So, um, so the, the cyber attacker that goes in through the, um, the Trojan horse that's in the, the, the phone app can now start doing lots of malicious things to the various, um, various elements in the vehicle. So the app, like I say, now has access to the CAN bus. Um, the CAN bus controls the, the braking and the steering elements within the vehicle. Um, so the vehicle is now potentially at risk. However, when 
the Trojan horse that, that's, that's found its way into the vehicle attempts to try and access the memory of these critical systems, um, what you see when you monitor that, that really detailed level of the, the vehicle infrastructure is you see access of the memory, for example, say the braking system being requested by the infotainment system. So is that a, a legal transaction? Well, uh, in normal operation, you would never expect the infotainment system of the vehicle to want to go and access the memory within the braking system. So our on-chip monitor detects these communications and, and it knows that's not expected, it knows that's an illegal transaction. So with that, um, it mitigates those transactions and will block them. So, um, so none of those requests from the infotainment system to access the, the, the memory around the braking system get through. So the attack is mitigated um, and we're able to collect that data and we're able to send that up to the cloud. Um, so we, we've got record of the sort of attacks that are, are occurring. So for our passenger, Another happy, uneventful trip to work, completely unaware of what's gone on throughout the situation. Um, and, and that's the way we, we like to, to see it. So we want to make sure that, like I say, the, the, the passengers and the, within the vehicle aren't affected by, by these types of, types of incidents. So just talking about what we're doing within Siemens, um, so, so Siemens has a, an extremely wide range of um, technology that both on the manufacturing side, the functional safety side, the in-life monitoring, management and security. Um, and we like to think that all of these elements of test, safety and security is really kind of embedded in our DNA and the way that we do things. So... Let's look at where we're going in the future. Um, so software defined vehicles are really, really starting to um, kind of become the next technology, um, the next level of kind of vehicle um, technology that, that's coming. Um, but always remember, the software is only as good as the hardware it's built upon. So the hardware is really the cornerstone of, of everything that builds up a software-defined vehicle. Um, and as more and more features and functionality get added to the software, the requirements around that hardware continue to explode in terms of the compute performance that's, that's required. And as you know, with your, your, your phone and your PC, there's never a decrease in terms of hardware requirements. The hardware requirements are always uh, in, increasing. And then especially when, when vehicles and safety are, are, are paramount, um, safety and security are really fundamental to the overall development of these software-defined uh, vehicles. So really critically important when we're, we're developing the, the overall hardware um, for these, these vehicles of the future. So with that, I'll wrap up uh, and just say one last thing. Um, if the technologies you've seen just a glimpse of today are of interest, um, we've just published a very, very nice ebook uh, that can be found on the Siemens website that goes into a lot of details for, for each of these different technology areas. So if you're interested, go take a look, uh, drop me a line and uh, yeah, we can we have more detailed discussion. Thank you very much. Lee of Siemens over in San Francisco Bay, thank you very much indeed. Before we hear from Paul, our next speaker, just to let you know that the next Asian Tech Talk will be on Wednesday the 20th of March with Dan Fowler of Warwick University. And the talk will be Project Res Auto, Assessing Capability Enhanced Microprocessors for Future Cyber Resilient Automotive Systems. The next webinar from the IoT Security Foundation will be on Thursday, the 28th of March. The first confirmed guest for that one is Ken Munro of Pentest Partners, 
who presents on aviation. If you're watching this live, the links to register for one or both of these upcoming broadcasts are in the Zoom chat facility. So we'll have a QA and a section soon. There's already plenty of questions coming in on the Zoom chat facility, but if you have any questions, observations, comments, or whatever, do use the Zoom chat facility if you're watching this live, and we'll put those questions and comments to our speakers towards the end of the hour. Up next in this joint broadcast from ASIN and the IoT Security Foundation, it's Paul Wooderson of Hariva Myra, and he's going to be talking about hardware security. So now we cross over to England's Midlands. Paul, it's over to you, my friend.